Viva New Jersey by Gloria Gonzalez, illustrated by Melody Rosales. Genre Realistic fiction stories have settings and characters that seem like real people, though the stories are made up. As you read, notice the details in the story that give the feeling of reality. Question of the Week How do we learn to connect with others in a new place? As far as dogs go, it wasn't much of a prize, a hairy mongrel with clumps of bubblegum wadded on its belly. Pieces of multicolored hard candies were matted in its fur. The leash around its neck was fashioned from a cloth belt, the kind usually seen attached to old bathrobes. The dog's paws were clogged with mud from yesterday's rain, and you could see where the animal had gnawed at the irritated skin around the swollen pads. The dog was tied to an anemic tree high above the cliffs overlooking the Hudson River and the majestic New York City skyline. Lucinda traveled the route each day on her way to the high school, along the New Jersey side of the river. The short walk saddened her, despite its panoramic vista of bridges and skyscrapers, for the river reminded her of the perilous journey six months earlier, when she and her family had escaped from Cuba in a makeshift boat with seven others. They had spent two freezing nights adrift in the ocean, uncertain of their destination, till a U.S. Coast Guard cutter towed them to the shores of Key West. From there, they wound their way north, staying temporarily with friends in Miami and finally settling in West New York, New Jersey, the most densely populated town in the United States. Barely a square mile high above the Palisades, the town boasted... a population of 47,000. Most of the community was housed in mammoth apartment buildings that seemed to reach into the clouds. The few private homes had cement lawns and paved driveways where there should have been backyards. Lucinda longed for the spacious front porch where she'd sat at night with her friends while her grandmother bustled about the house, humming her Spanish songs. Lucinda would ride her bike to school and sometimes not see a soul for miles, just wildflowers amid a forest of greenery. Now it was cement and cars and trucks and motorcycles and clanging fire engines that seemed to be in constant motion, shattering the air with their menacing roar. Lucinda longed painfully for her grandmother. The old woman had refused to leave her house in Cuba, despite the family's pleas so she had remained behind, promising to see them again one day. The teenager, tall and slight of build, with long, dark hair that reached down her spine, was uncomfortable among her new classmates, most of whom she towered over. Even though the majority of them spoke Spanish and came from Cuba, Argentina, and Costa Rica, they were not like any of her friends back home. These American girls wore heavy makeup to school, dressed in jeans and high heels, and talked about rock singers and TV stars that she knew nothing of. They all seemed to be busy, rushing through the school corridors, huddling in laughing groups, mingling freely with boys, and chatting openly with teachers as if they were personal friends. It was all too confusing. Things weren't much better at home. Her parents had found jobs almost immediately, and were often away from the tiny, cramped apartment. Her brother quickly made friends and was picked for the school baseball team, traveling to nearby towns to compete. All Lucinda had were her memories, and now this dog, whom she untied from the tree. The animal was frightened and growled at her when she approached, but she spoke softly and offered a soothing hand, which he tried to attack. Lucinda persisted, and the... dog, perhaps grateful to be freed from the mud puddles, allowed her to lead him away. She didn't know what she was going to do with him now that she had him. Pets were not allowed in her building, and her family could be evicted. She couldn't worry about that now. 
Her main concern was to get him out of the cold. Even though it was April and supposedly spring, the weather had yet to top 50 degrees. At night, she slept under two blankets, wearing warm socks over her cold feet. Another night outdoors and the dog could freeze to death. Lucinda reached her building and comforted the dog. I'm not going to hurt you. She took off her jacket and wrapped it quickly around the animal, hoping to disguise it as a bundle under her arm. Don't make any noise, she begged. She waited till a woman with a baby stroller exited the building and quickly dashed inside unseen. She opted not to take the elevator, fearful of running into someone, and instead lugged the dog and her school bag up the eight flights of stairs. Lucinda quickly unlocked the apartment door and plopped the dog on her bed. The animal instantly shook its hair free and ran in circles atop her blanket. Don't get too comfortable, Lucinda cautioned. You can't stay. She dashed to the kitchen and returned moments later with a bowl of water and a plate of leftover chicken and yellow rice. The dog bolted from the bed and began attacking the food before she even placed it on the floor. The girl sat on the edge of the bed and watched contently as he devoured the meal. How long has it been since you've eaten? The dog swallowed the food hungrily, not bothering to chew, and quickly lapped up the water. It was then, with the dog's head lowered to the bowl, that Lucinda spotted the small piece of paper wedged beneath the belt around its neck. She slid it out carefully and saw the word that someone had scrawled with a pencil. Chauncey, is that your name? The dog leaped to her side and nuzzled its nose against her arm. It's a crazy name, but I think I like it, she smiled. Outside the window, eight stories below, two fire engines pierced the afternoon with wailing sirens. Lucinda didn't seem to notice as she stroked the animal gently. Working quickly, before her parents were due to arrive, she filled the bathtub with water and soap detergent and scrubbed the animal clean. The dog didn't enjoy it. He kept trying to jump out, so Lucinda began humming a Spanish song her grandmother used to sing to her when she was little. It didn't work. Chauncey still fought to get free. Once the animal was bathed, Lucinda attacked the clumps of hair with a scissor and picked out the sticky globs of candy. Look at that! You're white, Lucinda discovered. While using her brother's hair blower, she ran a quick comb through the fur, which now was silvery and tan with faint traces of black. You're beautiful, the girl beamed. The dog seemed to agree. It picked up its head proudly and flicked its long ears with pride. Lucinda hugged him close. I'll find you a good home, I promise, she told the animal. Knowing that her parents would arrive any moment, Lucinda gathered up the dog, covering him with her coat, and carried him down nine flights to the basement. She crept quietly past the superintendent's apartment and deposited the animal in a tiny room behind the bank of washing machines. The room, the size of a small closet, contained all the electrical levers that supplied power to the apartments and the elevator. Chauncey looked about, confused. He jumped up as if he knew he was about to be abandoned again. His white, hairy paw came dangerously close to hitting the protruding, red master switch near the door. Lucinda knelt to the animal. I'll be back. Promise. She closed the door behind her, hoping the dog wouldn't bark, and hurried away. An outline of a plan was taking shape in her mind. Ashley. The girl sat in front of her in English and always went out of her way to say hi. She didn't seem to hang out with the other kids, and whenever they passed in the corridor, she was alone. But what really made her even more appealing was that she lived in a real house, just a block away. Lucinda had seen her once going in. Maybe Ashley would take Chauncey. Lucinda's parents arrived from work, and she quickly helped her mother prepare the scrumptious fried bananas. Her father had stopped at a restaurant on his way home and brought a cantina of food, white rice, black beans, avocado salad, and meat stew. Each food was placed in its own metal container and clipped together like a small pyramid. 
The local restaurant would have delivered the food to the house each day if the family desired, but Lucinda's father always liked to stop by and check the menu. The restaurant also made fried bananas, but Lucinda's mother didn't think they were as. tasty as her own. One of the nice surprises of moving to New Jersey was discovering that the Latin restaurants supplied cantina service. How was school today? her mother asked. Okay, Lucinda replied. The dinner conversation drifted, as it always did, to Mama's problems at work with the supervisor and Papa's frustration with his job. Every day he had to ride two buses and a subway to get to work which he saw as wasted hours. You get an education, go to college, Lucinda's father sermonized for the thousandth time, and you can work anywhere you like, even in your own house if you want, like a doctor. And if it is far away, you hire someone like me with no education to drive you. Lucinda had grown up hearing the lecture. Perhaps she would have been a good student anyway, for she certainly took to it with enthusiasm. She had discovered books at a young age. School only heightened her love of reading, for its library supplied her with an endless source of material. She excelled in her studies and won top honors in English class. She was so proficient at learning the English language that she served as a tutor to kids in lower grades. Despite her father's wishes, Lucinda had no intention of becoming a doctor or lawyer. She wasn't sure what she would. do. The future seemed far too distant to address it, but she knew somehow it would involve music and dance and magnificent costumes and glittering shoes and plumes in her hair. They were talking about her brother's upcoming basketball game when suddenly all the lights in the apartment went out. ¿Qué pasó? her father exclaimed. Agitated voices could be heard from the outside hallway. A neighbor banged on the door shouting, call the fire department! Someone's trapped in the elevator. Groups of tenants mingled outside their apartments, some carrying candles and flashlights. The building had been pitched into darkness. We'll get you out, someone shouted to the woman caught between floors. Lucinda cried, Chauncey! He must have hit the master switch. She could hear the distant wail of the fire engines and knew it was only a matter of minutes before they checked the room where the dog was hidden. I'll be right back, Lucinda yelled to her mother as she raced out the door. Groping onto the banister, she felt her way down the flights of steps as people with candles hurried to escape. The rescuers reached the basement before she did. Two firemen were huddled in the doorway checking the power supply. Lucinda looked frantically for the dog, but he was gone. She raced out into the nippy night, through the throng of people crowded on the sidewalk, and searched for the dog. She was afraid to look in the street, expecting to see his lifeless body, the victim of a car. Lucinda looked up at the sound of her name. Her mother was calling to her from the window. Come home! What are you doing? The girl shouted, In a minute! The crowd swelled about her as she quickly darted away. Lucinda didn't plan it, but she found herself in front of Ashley's house minutes later. She was on the sidewalk with the rest of her neighbors, gazing up the block at the commotion in front of Lucinda's building. Hi, Lucinda stammered. Ashley took a moment to place the face and then returned the smile. Hi. Lucinda looked about nervously, wondering if any of the adults belonged to Ashley's family. She didn't have a moment to waste. What happens, she blurted out, when a dog runs away? Do the police catch it? The blonde chubby teenager with light green eyes and glasses with pink frames shrugged. Probably. If they do, they only take it to the pound. What's that? It sounded bad, whatever it was. A shelter where they keep animals. If nobody claims them, they kill them. Lucinda started to cry. She couldn't help it. It came upon her suddenly. Greatly embarrassed, she turned quickly and hurried away. Wait up, the blonde hurried after her. 
Hey! Lucinda stopped, too ashamed to meet her eyes. Did you lose your dog? Ashley's voice sounded concerned. Lucinda nodded. Well, let's go find him, Ashley prodded. They searched the surrounding neighborhood and checked underneath all the cars parked in the area in case he was hiding. They searched basements and rooftops. When all else failed, they walked to the park along the river where Lucinda pointed out the tree where she had found him. The girls decided to sit on a nearby bench in case Chauncey reappeared, though they realized there was little hope. Lucinda knew her mother would be frantically worried. She probably has the police looking for me, she told Ashley. You've only been gone an hour. It's the first time I've left the house except to go to school. Since we moved here, she revealed. It was a beautiful night, despite the cold tingling breeze that swept up from the river. The New York skyline was ablaze with golden windows silhouetted against dark, box-like steel structures. You could make out the red traffic lights along the narrow streets. A long, thin barge sailed down the river like a rubbery snake. Lucinda learned that Ashley's mother was a lawyer, often away from home for long periods, and her father operated a small business in New York's Chinatown, which kept him busy seven days a week. An only child, she spent her time studying and writing letters with her. A shelter where they keep animals. If nobody claims them, they kill them. Lucinda started to cry. She couldn't help it. It came upon her suddenly. Greatly embarrassed, she turned quickly and hurried away. Wait up, the blonde hurried after her. Hey! Lucinda stopped, too ashamed to meet her eyes. Did you lose your dog? Ashley's voice sounded concerned. Lucinda nodded. Well, let's go find him. Ashley prodded. They searched the surrounding neighborhood and checked underneath all the cars parked in the area in case he was hiding. They searched basements and rooftops. When all else failed, they walked to the park along the river where Lucinda pointed out the tree where she had found him. The girls decided to sit on a nearby bench in case Chauncey reappeared, though they realized there was little hope. Lucinda knew her mother would be frantically worried. She probably has the police looking for me, she told Ashley. You've only been gone an hour. It's the first time I've left the house except to go to school. Since we moved here, she revealed. It was a beautiful night, despite the cold tingling breeze that swept up from the river. The New York skyline was ablaze with golden windows silhouetted against dark, box-like steel structures. You could make out the red traffic lights along the narrow streets. A long, thin barge sailed down the river like a rubbery snake. Lucinda learned that Ashley's mother was a lawyer, often away from home for long periods, and her father operated a small business in New York's Chinatown, which kept him busy seven days a week. An only child, she spent her time studying and writing letters. Who do you write to? Lucinda asked. My grandmother, mostly. She lives in Nevada. I spend the summers with her. Lucinda told her how lucky she was to be able to see her grandmother. She felt dangerously close to tears again and quickly changed the subject. I never see you with any friends in school. Why? Ashley shrugged. Guess I'm not the friendly type. Most of the girls are only interested in boys and dates. I intend to be a famous writer one day, so there's a lot of books I have to read, just so I know what's been done. It made sense. What are you going to be? Lucinda admitted she had no ambition, no particular desire. But maybe if she had her choice, if she could be anything she wanted, it would probably be a dancer. My grandmother used to take me to her friend's house who used to be a famous ballerina in Cuba. She'd let me try on her costumes, and she'd play the records and teach me the steps. It hurt my feet something awful. Hers used to bleed when she first started, but she said it got easier after the first year. Ashley told her, You have the body for it. I bet you'd make a wonderful dancer. When it became apparent that Chauncey would never return, the girls walked home together.
Despite all that had happened, Lucinda found herself sad to have the evening end. For the first time since leaving her homeland, she felt somewhat at peace with herself. She now had someone to talk to, someone who understood, someone who carried her own pain. Want to have lunch tomorrow? Ashley asked her. I usually run home and eat in front of the television. I'm a great cook. My first book is going to be filled with exotic recipes of all the countries I plan to visit. And if you want, she gushed excitedly, after school we can go to the library. You can get out a book on how to be a ballerina. Lucinda agreed immediately. That would be wonderful. The girls parted on the sidewalk and Lucinda raced home where her irate father and weeping mother confronted her angrily. Where have you been? I was only going to wait five more minutes and then I was calling the police. Where were you? Before she could stammer a reply, the lights went out. Not again, her mother shrieked. Lucinda's heart throbbed with excitement. Chauncey was back. She ran out of the apartment, unmindful of the darkness, with her mother's screams in the air. Come back here! This time, Lucinda made it to the basement before the firemen, and she led her pal safely out of the building. She reached Ashley's doorstep, just as the first fire engine turned the corner.